A lot of your musical life and your artistic life is driven by fear and terror. <laughs> and in the early days, my fear was always the audience would leave. We used to play a lot of these student unions and you looked up and you thought, oh, they could go away because the gig's free. They could just go away and the bar's free over there. So you could, we could, that could happen. Right. First thing I need to do is just to say congratulations on you being you and being together in your in the world of showbiz where where relationships come and go like dance music genres <laughs> you i mean i was at a 25th year anniversary on, of friends on saturday and i and i and i was thinking god that's Im impressive but yeah. i said i'm i'm interviewing ricky you and know, lorraine and she's a beard it's all just, just a fake. <laughs> how long has it been 33 how years 33 years, years. Yeah. and we were our daughter, our youngest daughter, was married um, just a few weeks ago, and she was married just along the Loch Loch Lomond from oh, where we were married. So it yeah. was like lovely, actually. Oh my gosh, I spent last summer there. Did I had, you? I've got such a huge soft spot for Loch Lomond. Oh, I it's, love it's it. Beautiful. It's, it's so beautiful. It was the mo at that time it was the most in inspiring holiday that ah, I've, that I've, did you I've get ever good had. We had the best weather. It was like the it was the hottest. It was that two oh, yeah, weeks yeah, yeah. when it, Scotland had never been hotter oh. since it was a volcano <laughs> you know <laughs> so oh, it yeah it's, it's so the beautiful. lock was like it was like being in a Turkish bath it was it was unbelievable oh, I so shallow where we were. like that I did that as well and it was lovely it was just but yes it was but any, anyway look I, I just wanted to it would be really lovely to get each of your individual perspectives <laughs> on being in a band with your other half <laughs> ladies first well, it's kind of boring, really. Uh, I would like to say something a lot more interesting, but it's actually been really great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have had the pleasure of having the most enjoyable career and having it with the person you love by your side. So when we go off and do all these fantastic things and the rest of the guys are all leaving their wives at home and their kids at home and, you know, it's hard. We, we don't have that, you know. It used to be a struggle when when the, our kids were young and we had to work out how we were going to deal with all that. But now there is a real sense of freedom. Our kids are all grown up and we can go on tour and not have to worry about them. Oh, it's yeah. been great. And then, so Ricky, all of those, all of those um, predictable songs about missing your other half never happened. <laughs> no, they didn't. No, they didn't. <laughs> no, we, I mean, the thing is we, you know, we got together because... We actually loved a lot of the same music as well. That's that's one of the things, and we still do. We still love listening to things. You know, in the car, putting things on, in the kitchen, um, and I think that we just work together really well. You know, Lorraine does a different. Lorraine's, you know, a whole different discipline to, to what I do, and she loves singing. I, and I don't really think of myself as a singer primarily. I I, I sing because I have to, and it just kind of comes out that way. But I think that. You know, in terms of the work we do, that's what happens. And then socially, well, we kind of like being together. We like traveling the world together. So, <laughs> Wonderful. yeah, it works out well. How heartwarming. Well, let's go right back to the start when it was all a blank page. What were the dreams that you were having and what were you looking at and listening to while you were having those dreams? Well, I had a friend, I, I was in a band, different bands, you know, and one, one of the bands that I was in, um, my friend said, I said, well, what do you want to do? You know, you, that way when you're in a band and you're getting nowhere, you know, it's like nothing's happening. I said, well, what, what do you actually want to do? And my friend said to me, I want to make an album. And I just thought, that's a great ambition. That's a great thing. Because making an album involves someone putting up some money somewhere for it. And I just thought, that's something I'd love to do. I just really wanted to make an album. And it was such an obsession that, it was the only thing I could really think about. And, you know, when we made Rain Town, which was the album that I eventually got to make, none of us, including me, give any thought to making anything other than an album. Maybe that's why people listen to it still as an album, because there was no thought given to how we're going to sell the damn thing and how, you know, the singles and so on. There was nothing of that. And it was just the joy of, of making that album. And we didn't all have the same vision because we all came in at different points. You know, we all, mm -hmm. Lorraine came in different time Doogie came in with me probably at the start Lorraine came in quite early on and went away and came back again mm -hmm. um, but I certainly I think making that album was the thing that united us I would think yeah and and why a band because it could have very easily given that you've written the entire back catalogue Ricky been you know Ricky Ross and the Roth tones you know <laughs> good name Rosette <laughs> yeah, you missed a trick that? there the Rosette yeah. Ricky Ross and the Rosette yeah. yeah but everyone would think it's Rosette <laughs> well as I like I mean I often say when you put a band together 
you want to have the people that are 10 times better musicians than you are and that's what I did I picked a brilliant drummer I picked a brilliant keyboard player a brilliant you know all of them and then a brilliant singer that could sing anything and Lily never needs a lyric sheet written she never reads she never needs told what harmonies to sing because they just come so you want people around you and I don't have these chops at all I, I you know I, I kind of barely have them enough to get I get on stage and I can do my thing and I, I feel I'm a, I'm a good band leader I'm quite good at taking them into the into the battle as you know in the old days which is sometimes doing gigs at you know <laughs> university unions and yeah. support gigs you know all these kind of things I'm good at doing that but I really do need other people and I think there's something about the magic about that happens with all these people. They're really important. They're really important people. Yeah. It's it's never and, and you listen to my solo records and they're not as good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I guess that there was a pressure. Um, you had to pick great musicians because you named yourself after one of the greatest yeah. Steely Dan songs. So you, yeah. so there's a pressure there then exactly, to yeah. to follow that that yeah. that line. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have to like Steely Dan and my Desert Island Band. Oh wow. And, and, and when the world knows your name is one of the ten albums that I would happily listen to for the rest of my life. Oh. If I if I could only pick ten to go on that desert island, you know, like Asia would be one of them. And when the world knows your name would be another, along wow. with Talk Talk and Tears for Fears and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, sorry, I've gone I've gone completely down a, a <laughs> rabbit hole. I don't know what, what my point That's was going good. to be. No, it's great. Um, um, uh, we're talking about what your dreams were and what your hopes were when you started yeah. the whole thing. And I think for me, I just I came to Glasgow. I was 18, full of life, full of wonder, full of music. Didn't know how that was going to express itself. Ended up joining bands, singing about, and then hearing this brilliant band. I mean, I knew Ricky, I knew Ewan. In fact, I shared a flat with Ewan, our bass player. I had this brilliant band, and I actually went to see them live at the QM Union in Glasgow. I went to see Deacon Blue and I was just blown away by them and just thought, if there's any band I'm going to be in, it's going to be this one, you know. Fantastic. So that was, they will be mine. They will be mine. <laughs> or I will be theirs. One <laughs> and so then you you come to your first your first record, you know, you have your, your whole life to, to make that, they say, you know, to mm, make, your, you make your debut album. And you, you said you didn't know what the singles would be. You just wanted to make the album. But I mean, we have to talk about Dignity because I mean, what a debut single that was. I only realized actually um, the other day that that was your debut single. I think I'd completely forgotten. <laughs> well, it didn't do very well. That's no. probably why. Uh, well, I mean, but that's a brave thing to do mm. to release what I believe to be just one of the greatest singles ever, you know, that, that has one of my favorite, the most evocative, simple and beautiful pictures in your mind lyric ever for me is, he packed his lunch in a sun blessed bag. It's just, it's just <laughs> such a beautiful, beautiful line. But like, it's quite a brave thing to release something as good as that, to not hold that up your sleeve. Interesting that you, you know, you say you well, didn't do that well. Dignity was a song that really got us, I mean, we, that song has probably taken us places that we never thought we'd get to. Mm -hmm. And Dignity was one of three songs that we did a demo. And I had a publishing deal at the time. I had a publishing deal with ATV Music, which at the time had just been bought over by Michael Jackson. It was really a weird time. And it, it'd been, the person that was administrating my publishing uh, said, you can have one more time in the studio. You've got to make a demo. But this is the last, you know, you know you're going to get this money. It was, I think it was a thousand pounds and not a penny more. And we went in and we cut three songs, a song called Just Like Boys, a song called The Very Thing and Dignity. And it so happened there was a piano in the studio, a real piano left over from the band that had been there the night before, which was a bit of luck. Jim is a brilliant piano player. Um, and we we cut the song and that was a song that got us a record deal. So Gordon Charlton, who signed us, yeah. fell in love with that song. Yeah, we owe him a lot, really, yeah. don't we? Yeah, and I think that song, when we started playing gigs, was the song that people related to. So I think it became, and of course we were playing it live before we made the, the album. Yes. By the time that Rain Time came out, we'd played a, a few shows, including the one that Lorraine probably saw. Yeah. But I think, so that song was our, our calling card, I guess, and, and that, that, was, that was why we put it out as a single. We didn't, I mean, it's so funny now because people will say, oh, I played that on the radio. No one played it on the radio. But So if someone did play it on the radio, it, it, it was a great thing. But it, it actually had more traction in America and in Holland than it had in 
in uh, in the UK at the time. Yeah. So it was it was odd. It was really strange. But eventually, it became a kind of sort of hit, but not very. Not, but then it became a bigger song than it became a hit. Really, I it was a course. slow burn. Yeah, yes, it, it was, was a slow burn. And then the audience claimed it. I think the more because we did a lot of touring, and uh, we realised that the song was being claimed by the audience in a way to the to the point that now. We don't really sing it, you know. We they sing it. We try and sing it. Yeah, as a kind of battle, but but the audience want to sing it, and it's a wonderful thing. It's a folk to song. Behold. And, you know, I, yeah. I think songs go out in the ether. They, you, you put a song out, and and they they take on life of their own. And that's mm. part of what folk music is, and I think we're in that. I like to think I'm still part of that tradition because I think that's handing songs on, passing things on, and I think that we're in that great tradition of, of music. And, and I love the fact that people have taken it on and they'll change it, you know, mm. uh, and that that's good. And then of course, many, many, many thousands of people, me, the young me included, <laughs> discovered it in retrospect when they fell in love with your next record, which we have to spend some time on because there are so many hits on it. And you know, people really, really love this record. Like I say, it's a top, it's an all time top 10 for me. And so you had then this, this crystallization of Warren Livesey producing and Bob Clearmount and mixing. And it made it so hi fi and so mm. like glistening. Yes. Everything about it, it just almost gives me goosebumps just yes. thinking about it. Um, yeah, what, what's your perspective on it as a, as, a, as a piece of work? It sounded a lot more sophisticated, didn't it, than Rain Town? It had a. Had a a sonic quality to it, I think, just by the, especially by Bob Clearmount, and I mm. would say that really uh, was was a step forward for yeah. us. But song-wise, I think we were talking about this earlier, I think Ricky had made a very clear decision in his mind that we were going to have singles on this record, that he was going to write great songs, but they were going to be songs that radio stations would want to play. Right. Because very, you know, very few things were played off Rain Town. Yeah, I mean, Rain Town was a, a miracle in some ways. I don't think you would get away with it now because we didn't really have hits off it, but people were buying their album, people were buying the album. And then we brought a Real Gone Kid, which was the f way ahead of the mm. album being, it had been recorded. And we got lucky and people couldn't buy any other album. So they went back and bought Rain Town for about six yes. months. Yeah. And then we, st you know, then we had started to have some radio singles on When the World Knows Your Name and I basically thought I was so terrified uh, a lot of your musical life and your artistic life is driven by fear and terror <laughs> and in the early days my fear was always the audience would leave we used to play a lot of these student unions and you looked up and you thought, oh, they could go away because the gig's free. They could just go away and the bar's free over there. So you could, we could, that could happen. And then also you just thought, well, sometime the radio are not going to play you. So I wanted to make sure we just put out one, two, three, four, you know, hit, you know, some, some songs that were actually going to be played on the radio. And I said, look, the first four or five songs, in fact, the first six, I thought, were going to be all singles. It turned out that Fergus Sings the Blues was one of the bigger ones. It was on the second side. But the first five songs of that, first, certainly the first four songs of that record were singles. Well, let's dig into that. I mean, what a way to start with that lovely, <laughs> lovely doogie shuffle on <laughs> Queen of the New yeah. Year. And it's sort of, you know, it's yeah. so sort of exciting. It's such an exciting, it was such an it exciting, is. I remember dropping the needle on it and hearing that beautiful oh. snare shuffle. Yeah. And it still sort of gives me goosebumps now. What a way to start. Yeah, and actually, we're, revisited that song recently because we're doing this little acoustic uh, campfire kind of album that we all gather in and, and that's been reinterpreted and and it's been fun to kind of discover that song again Jim yeah. I mean Jim a lot of these songs that were co-writes with Jim Jim obviously a great piano player but he <laughs> had this old guitar in the house and he used to uh, he, used, he came in one day with his guitar riff playing on the guitar and said I, I like, really like this hook and I just loved it I loved the fact that it was so different to anything else we were doing and it felt like yeah it's twangy and country it's kind of yeah it was almost like it yeah it was great it's been great fun actually doing it acoustically it's kind of re I've rediscovered love for that song, I have to say. Yeah. And vocally now it's become Gregor, our guitarist, is a great singer too, and we use him a lot live. So it's really, really good fun at the end now. Can't wait to do it. 
know, it's great to strip these things down, isn't it? Because there's nowhere to hide. You're just, right. just the song, right? I and know, it's, got, it's a bit scary, it's, to be well, honest. It's, well, it's got to be a good song. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, it's like poaching an egg. That's you, you right. Know, yeah, it's easily cock it up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, let's just dive into a few of these songs. So, so let's. I'm going to say a song, and then you're going to give me a story or how it came together or something. So, Wages Day. Wages Day was a song that actually originally was a B-side. We had gone and cut... There was so much demand for B-sides in the in the 80s and 90s that every single that came out had about five or six extra things on them. And we went and cut a whole lot of songs as B-sides. Another song at that time was Back Here in Bino Land, which eventually came out as Las Vegas. And there were some good songs there. Um, but when we did Wages Day, I remember thinking, wait a minute, this is, this is better than that. You know, it's, it's, I'm <laughs> yeah. sure we can do... You know. And actually... Um, so we cut it for the album and I always remember we were mixing it with Bob Clearmountain and uh, Bob said you know what the piano's playing that riff but the guitar should play that riff as well dun, 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 dun. and uh, uh, he was mixing got a, a big Fender amp uh, sorry a big Marshall stack Yes, got Graham in played it again at mix and put the guitar riff on it again and mixed it and that was great Bob was great at doing that just making it right in your face and wow. it needs that let's do it that's yeah. great because that's yeah. not a mixer's job no it's not it's, but that's the thing about I discovered this about Bob really early that uh, he also reco- we, we'd worked with him as a recording engineer as a recording producer and he was he's just quick he was fast yeah. but, but really great you know great to work with I just remember hearing it for the first time and, and thinking God I can't wait to do this song live and it instantly really became a a great live song for us and it still is probably you know, something we play more than anything oh, yeah. so I would play I play it's, it solo I would... it's very rarely dropped from any set isn't yeah. it oh yeah. that'd be a riot if you dropped yeah. that we did it <laughs> for fun fun enough at the Albert Hall we were doing it one time we did it we left it right to the end and played it acoustically which it kind of works kind of acoustically and we we asked any man I said it's only got three chords in it I said can anyone out there play the guitar so throughout the tour we'd get people out from the audience we'd teach them wages day on the spot and they would come and play it with us and it worked a treat till we got to Dublin <laughs> <laughs> and the guy that came on stage was so drunk that that's right <laughs> that he actually put the plectrum on his head <laughs> And we thought, you know what, that one, we've done that one. Let's oh, stop it was, there. It was so good, though, because all they had to do, you said, can anyone out there play acoustic guitar? Only three chords and the hands would go up. Yeah. And then you chose the wrong guy in Dublin. Oh, <laughs> the wrong guy. Yeah. yeah, I guess easy to do, like generalising Dubliners. Um, oh, so, between you, how about Real Gone Kid? Tell me, um, tell me uh, something about that. Real Gone Kid started life in London, one night I went John Kelly I remember we went to the Marquee the old Marquee Club in Wardour Street yes and uh, went in one night to see this band Lone Justice that I'd heard were playing and it turned out a few weeks later we, we did a gig with them actually we supported them and there's this uh, singer Maria McKee she was amazing and I remember thinking wow and I just read for the first time I'd read um, Jack Kerouac's, Kerouac's On The Road and every time they came to a kind of some place they would they would get a saxophonist and it was all kind of blues music oh, cat's real gone it's real gone you know and they would just get blown away by it and I was sort of blown away by Maria McKee I just thought she was mm. amazing I thought she was a, such a brilliant front singer and at the same time I guess I was falling in love with a woman that had become my wife and I wrote the first verse about Maria McKee and the second verse about Lorraine <laughs> <laughs> and, and what a songwriter as well Maria yeah absolutely oh, and we actually ended up hanging out with her much later yeah um, she's phenomenal yeah her but, voice is one of my favourite voices and she's a great songwriter too yes, I mean absolutely. she wrote for Fergal yeah Fergal Sharky exactly yeah. Yeah. That yeah. those are, are uh, yeah he's got he's her to thank for his number one he his has. only number one song. yeah a good yeah. heart a good heart absolutely so yeah it was it was a kind of a song that we that actually started out live again like Dignity we started playing it live we started playing it before it came out and we kind of felt that it got a great reaction we kind of knew but we didn't quite know how good a reaction it was going to get because it was well I think Peter our manager <clears throat> he was pretty sure that that was mm. going to be a a hit you know he yeah and he was right <laughs> I remember the day that we were coming back from a gig and in the old days you heard the chart live as it, at the same time as everyone else heard it and, and it was it was meant to go up to I think it'd been at number 15 or something like that. It was meant to go up and we're thinking, oh, it'd be great if it goes up. 
and of course it get, gets to number 10 wasn't number 10 we're thinking has it gone down and we and eventually we got to number, I think we got to number 8 and we was like wow <laughs> this is like you know this is we've got a top 10 yeah, song and yeah. it just made it such a difference to our life so so Real Gone Kid was the first top was the first time you penetrated the top 10 totally yeah, wow yeah. That, and how did that feel Oh, that really? used to feel brilliant on a, on a Sunday night. You know, we heard like everyone. You'd get a kind of prediction, midweek prediction. This is what we think, but we're not sure. So and so's got an album out, and blah blah yes. blah. And then Sunday night, we had to listen to the charts along with everyone else. Yes. When you think about it now, it's kind of mad, but it was so exciting. And you think the the kind of relief. Oh no, we're not that. We're not that. And then you started to doubt, God, have we missed it? You oh, know? God, yes. And then, but yeah. no, okay. and, it was and brilliant. On, and what are you doing on Thursday because you're going to Top of the Pops? So that's right, yes. that's right. Top of the Pops. And, and, right. and so how about Fergus Sings the Blues? How did that go? Fergus was a song that Jim uh, came up with, it really musically, everything. Uh, and I managed to ruin it with a really bad lyric at first. And unfortunately, that lyric has died somewhere buried out in my garden and will never resurface <laughs> and, uh, I love the story of a friend of mine Michael Mara uh, a great Dundee songwriter had this song called Gales Blue about a guy who was a kind of soul singer came from the Highlands and I just thought it's such a great idea we've got to run with that and uh, I just thought that this could be you know that that's that's a that's just a, a great idea uh, so I, I wholeheartedly just kind of whole scale just took that idea and, and ran with it and um, Johnny Mitchell had a song called Furry Sings the Blues which I loved as well and I thought so I'm, it's complete everything's ripped off like, that's what I'm it's, trying to say it's, well, it's magpie you've, you know. got, to, you've got to rip off your, yeah you've got to rip off from good rip people rip off the good ones yeah but, yeah uh, well, the talent yeah, borrows genius it's such a friend as a song it's been a it's been a it's a huge song for us and uh, and was you know a, probably the second biggest single of that of that record and still to this day it's like a yeah, it's it's a it, it's a it's a friend. <laughs> Absolutely, and another one that there would be a riot if it wasn't played. Yeah. Exactly, if it wasn't played live. Well, I think we've covered that incredible record. Um, unless there's something else that you want to add. No, no. Um, which brings us to fellow hoodlums, hoodlums, um, and you have now John Kelly, completely different producer. Mm. That brings more I guess intimacy more intimacy you know you have this huge yeah record and mm. so you couldn't really go any yeah. bigger than yeah. that so yeah you, why not get more intimate well I think fellow hoodlums was a kind of reaction to the success of um of the second album and I think you in particular especially going out and doing gigs we had been playing really big arena shows and stuff and you mm. you weren't loving that no and I think there was a freedom that comes with some success in an album to do what you want, you know, and have more control about the direction you want it to be in. And I think with the third one, we really enjoyed that. And I think it's a real band album. Yeah, it and is. And we a... chose where we wanted to go. We, w we went to Paris to record the album just because we wanted to, you know, it was a great time actually yeah. together as a band. Well, John John had been this amazing producer from yeah. Town that we'd worked with. So and going we back to John. We hadn't good. worked with him since, well, obviously worked with Warren. And I I never really clicked with Warren, I don't think, neither did you. I think he, was, he did a really great job, but there wasn't a kind of, I don't know, you know sympathetic yeah. kind of thing going on. And um, we, in the meantime, we'd recorded this Backrack and David EP, which was just a bit of fun, we thought ended up giving us a big hit single yes but we asked John Kelly to come and come and make that actually as it happens Lorraine and I's honeymoon which would have been the, the, the couple of days after we got married we were in the studio recording the Backrack and David <laughs> but we, we'd so enjoyed working with John again we thought right let's work with John Kelly and when we did we loved it absolutely we always worked, loved, loved working with John and, the, and that was that was Fellow Hoodlums was I think probably everyone would say the most enjoyable Deacon Blue record to make. It was just a really? joy. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think there was, I was listening to a lot of folk music. I think I just wanted to make something that just was simple, that just the band played what they wanted to play. We didn't try and, I don't know, we had, we'd had the single success. We didn't feel under pressure. Again, <laughs> I think halfway through, I think halfway through, oh, we haven't got a single here. But 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 we, we eventually did, actually. We eventually did have a sort of, 
big sort of single on it. Was that your Swaying Arms? Twist and Shout was uh, the one that uh, was, became a top ten, which was the pop single. But Swaying yes. Arms was the song that was really, yeah, I think yeah. it's probably still one of the best Deacon Blue songs. Uh, yeah. yeah, Twist and Shout. That's almost like where folk meets Scar. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's got that, an odd it's, one. It's, it's got it? that sort of skank yeah, to it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, that was Graham probably. And and, yeah. and I think of when I think of that album, I, I'm um, I'm struck by that, and it stayed with me. The cover of two guys kissing and in, in a beautiful embrace. You were ahead of the curve there. Well, I don't think it is two guys. I is think it, it not? Was, no, I don't think, I don't it, think it, thought it was. I always thought it was Oh, too. was it? I thought it was. Well, we had the curve. Okay, we're ahead of the curve. We didn't discuss that. <laughs> no. We just thought it was. I can't was. believe that, you, that you're having this discussion yeah, now. Yeah, we've never discussed no. that. I thought it was two guys. I never even thought of that. No, it was just these artists that we love from a big poster. We got it. We had it in our garage yeah. until recently and our daughter's claim it's a massive May Day poster and we loved it. Loved the artwork. It's not a woodcutter. Or yeah, well, they did do some printing. They're printmakers, really, and uh, they they did all the the stuff for the album. Again, we it was that point where we'd made enough sales of a record that we could do what we wanted to do. So that that was what we wanted to do was just to make you know put an image on the front of the record and and make the record the way we wanted. And oddly enough. I also had this idea that the running order, or the record was in my head before we made it. I always felt the 12 songs were the 12 songs. And that, <laughs> I'm not sure whether that was right or wrong, but it felt like a very complete record for me. And you're doing whatever you wanted to do. There was the point where you came to closing time and, you, and it was almost Stevie Wonder was what you wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sly and Sly and the Family Stone sample. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, go it's, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, but I guess, you know, you're smiling as I say that. Like there must have been a lo lovely freedom that, like you say, comes with success, takes the pressure off. Yeah, it was. And Lynn said we went to Paris. We I always remember cutting closing time actually, and a little Wurlitzer, and we we decided to turn all the lights down in the studio. And we just kind of really vibe in the whole thing. It was great, and everyone was really chilled out. And some, for some reason, the legs on the the Wurlitzer electric piano had <laughs> had not been fastened on properly. The whole damn thing collapsed on me. <laughs> so there's this little chilled out, beautiful kind of, and all you can hear is this. I'd love to get the tape off it. I think collapsing on. <laughs> Come out the sound of a keyboard player with a Wurlitzer deciding to send on <laughs> which, uh, which brings us to now to uh, on the timeline to 1993 and to whatever you say, say nothing. And here you get put with um, good old Paul Oakenfold, mm. who I've known for years and I love, and Steve Osborne, who I've never met, who I'd love to meet. Mm -hmm. And you know they were that was they were the sort of zeitgeist producers yeah. of yeah. the time you know and 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 previous to that i think it was i guess it must be factory records who you know the first time a dj had ever produced a record mm -hmm. was was paul and the, and the happy mondays yeah that was an exciting time but, but of course it sounds of a time doesn't yes, it it does it does and i think that we were kind of looking for a new direction i think yeah. what, what happens to a band is and and this is kind of odd thing that that you get kind of we've we've exhausted almost our own vaults and we, we you're kind of looking for something else to come in and steer it a little bit and I think we were and, and times if, musically were changing yeah, roundabout about us and you're yeah. thinking do we fit in here anymore yeah. you know and and so you do search around for inspiration from other places and I think mm -hmm. that's right and sometimes it works better than when other times but I think there were there were um, there were good. Good aspects and bad aspects. Yeah, it's actually again a really lovely record. It was really Lorraine enjoyable. Lorraine was expecting our first baby. Yeah, we were working out in this. It, it actually, was a heat wave out in Oxfordshire in this little studio, the Manor, Richard. Oh yes, the, I know. Yeah. And it was beautiful. And it was just great fun. And Steve was great fun. Paul yeah. used to come in and out, and we didn't know anyone like Paul. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was just. Yeah. Paul took the guys to uh, the Ministry of Sound, you know. Yes. And we, we, this just wasn't who we were, but it was just really entertaining. And Paul was lovely. Steve, I, I, I don't know. You remember he came to see us, we were we were uh, sound checking before we worked <laughs> with him. At the Hammersmith Odeon. Yeah. At the Hammersmith Odeon. And Steve came to the sound check. And he was there, you know, there was incredible... Uh, seemed to be he really needed to be a cool guy you know and not get too excited about anything so we were sound checking new songs that he might yeah. be interested in and I uh, at this point didn't play any instruments but we had a a mandolin on stage that I had picked up and I was, words, yeah. I, I was hitting one string in the mandolin and Steve came down onto the stage after it and so I went I like the mandolin bit <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah. but actually he was good fun to work with Steve yeah he was and you know it was a 
you know, there was there was bits of that record. I mean, Your Town was probably the song that yeah. we never really followed up, but it was pr probably one of, in some ways, a kind of amazing single. It's an us. anthem. It's yeah, the one yeah. that, when you hear that album, it's the one that, because yeah. I was just going through everything, you know, on Saturday, just mm -hmm. to just box, <laughs> this incredible box set, and mm -hmm. sort of reminding, and that was the one that gave me that yeah. rush. And I remember yeah. hearing it on the radio, you know, at the time, that lovely bass line, that oh, wrote, and yeah. it, just so, such a lovely song. And we talked about Loch Lomond earlier on, but, um, Bethlehem's Gate was my Loch Lomond song bizar bizarrely enough because it was about this beautiful night that we had Lorraine's dad died not long after it and we had this amazing night we were going off on tour in 1989 and we were going off on tour for a long time and our Lorraine's brother and sister-in-law did this barbecue and it was a, it was the most beautiful night at Loch Lomond ever just gorgeous and it was like you know, you, one of these nights where you think, could it, could it not just go on forever? And well, his dad was there, and it was really special. And that's what Bethlehem's Gate was really about. It was just about that, the possibility of, of everything. You know? So there are some really great songs in that album. There are, and that's a song that we still do, yeah. Still do it. All Over the World, which is a song that yeah. we've revisited recently, yeah. It's great hearing these, these memories of yours. Um, so now we come to, the clock winds forward now, a long time, 2001. So hang on. So that was 1993, right? Yeah. So seven years. That's a sort of that's almost a Steely Dan length of time <laughs> yeah. to make a record. Well, we split up for five of them. So yeah. oh, is that what happened? Yeah. Of course, you split up. Split up. I did a solo record. Did yes. Another solo record. Lorraine started acting. Everyone, Doogie started. And doing we really thought it was forever. Yeah. I mean, we were absolutely certain that that was it. Yeah. You you kind of were the one who really drove the decision. You wanted to do other things. You wanted to make other kind of music, work with other people. It was a spectacular failure. And, <laughs> yeah, but, but we love. all thought it was over. And so we all got on with other things. And then we got back together five years later because we were involved in a charity who needed money. And we were thinking of all sorts of ways that we could raise money for them. And then Ricky said, you know, the best thing we could do is if we get the guys back together, we could do a do a gig and we literally said well you know do you think people come I mean where would we do it blah 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 and we we put it on sale and it sold out kind of instantly yes. and when we came on it was the biggest rush ever because people were going wild and we came off and we thought why did we stop doing this yeah. you know yeah. I think we'd all got a bit tired of each other we all needed to do other things but that really kind of re made us rem remember that there's a lot of fun and a lot of excitement in this and realise that we had a lot still to give. So love, yeah. that's why there was a big gap. Yeah, right. And, you know, in a band, it's an ecosystem and there's, <laughs> like, you know, there's yeah. and there's, there must have been lots of love for you all to get yeah. back together. Although I mean, Holmes, Doogie had, had become a broadcaster. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, the, the, with the Ken Loach movie and right. various other things. Uh, but um, to be honest with you, Homesick, was not a good record no. and it was not there was moments on it had love some lovely moments on it not least the lead single every time you sleep was i mm. think one of the better songs that i've written but um it just everyone wasn't about for it graham was ill graham would die three years later he had pancreatic cancer and it was a miracle that he even played on it at any extent because he was really ill at the time and you know it just was hard work it was just like pulling you know, yeah. pulling T3 to try and get everyone focused. And a lot of that was my fault because it wasn't in a perfect time frame for everyone else. So that was kind of how we were going to leave it, really, until yeah. basically 10 years later. Right, yeah. We well, we'll suddenly, come to that. Yeah. Well, well but I just want to give an honourable mention to Ray. Oh, it's a lovely song. Because, I mean, I'm a sucker for a dulcimer. <laughs> and and is, there, is there a theremin lurking in the background well, there of that? Well be, There's yeah. some, certainly something very sort of portmanteau that's that was a lovely song create. I mean again that's one of Jim's thing that he came with his idea and we ended, we just chased it down and Kenny McDonald who was producing the, the record with us kept saying do that melody he's doing da 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 and I thought oh yeah that's great so You've it was a lovely moment that, that happened song. in the studio yeah, you've yeah. been very fond of that song yeah there you go better record than you thought mm, <laughs> that's some good moments on it yeah. so then uh, gosh then 11 years or 10 years yeah, to, to, yeah. to then get together to make the hipsters, which sounded like the very essence of you, was back. Well, a lot of things had happened. Two things had happened, really. First of all, we decided that towards the end of the, two, the whatever you call the twenty, the two thousands, yeah, the noughties, the no, yeah, <laughs> and we we went. Um, we were on tour. We we're doing some tours, greatest hits tours, and Lorraine and I were saying to each other and the rest of the band, 
this is no use. We 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 either got to stop, call a halt, or got to do something creative. And um, I was looking for a new management. I went to see a guy called Nick Stewart. He's a lovely guy. Um, Nick was the guy that signed the Beatles. He's in the he's actually in the the Bono book. Um, and Nick said, you know, you guys should make an album. You should you should? And it was. I mean, I, maybe a hundred people said that to me, but for some reason this stuck stuck. And he said. You should be making an album. I went home. I was in London. I came back to Glasgow, and I had this little thing on my computer that said "The Hipsters," and a little riff uh, that that was the Hipsters um, mm. string riff. And I thought, yeah. And it, I, I found it so inspiring because I suddenly thought, you know what? Making an album with this band will be brilliant because we've got the best musicians. And by this time, Gregor had joined the band as a mm. guitarist, and he made such a an impact, I think, just creatively. And he come, started coming around to my house and we worked in the studio. Mm -hmm. And then we met Paul Savage, who was there our producer. Go. Right. So and that... Paul was just a gift to this band. Yeah. And, and I remember meeting Paul for a coffee and, I, and he said, but you've just got all these singles. What, what, you know, the, and the Hipsters was just a, a reinvention of, our, it was just a joy to make. It was just brilliant. And then we made about three records in a row with Paul. Yeah, well, it was you being creative again and us all being creative again after a period of kind of, lost in the wilderness about out doing gigs and finding y y we almost felt like a tribute band to ourselves you know yes because i think or i think it's important for an audience to feel that the band is still creatively active you know you don't want you can't just rely on past glories you have to prove you're alive yeah and yeah. i think that that changed everything really yeah yeah and giving giving your fans songs like you know the hipsters and and on the next tra uh, album a new house you, you like you say we're we're still here yeah. we're still a creative exactly. force you know the, the song that really the hipsters has been a huge song for us and but that song that that, that off the hipsters that, that we still is, is like our encore song now is that's what we can do which is really a song that i wrote for my my daughter really it's you know just it's just about what can you do for people other than do stuff for them you know oh, and, and it, love. Uh, people relate to that song because it's just about love it's just about the, the, the essence of, of of human beings well you 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 mentioned the word love and i'm and i want to kind of land this plane by saying um how amazing it is that i listened to city of love and uh you can watch my eyes and it, they, they might actually tear up here because all I have to do is think about on love. All I have to do is think about it. I don't even have to hear it for me to just get dewy eyed. Oh. I absolutely love that song so much. I don't think you've written a better song. Oh. Like you've written oh, so you. many amazing songs. Oh, wow. But like that's, isn't it wonderful that one of the greatest songs that you've written was one of the last songs that you wrote? Oh, how lovely. Well, that's the kind, I'll tell you the story, fun about talking about tearing up, is that I, I started writing a lot of uh, just memories and it led to me doing my memoir, which 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 came out last year. But in the meantime, um, that song was really quite important to me because I started writing about my grandfather in the song, and I thought, really, I'm going to let my grandfather take two lines of the song. I need to write more about him. Anyway, I finished the demo of it, which was just really what it is. It was just this, these five verses and then the, the little refrain. And Gregor came round to the house. I can't remember if I played it to Lena or not. And, but suddenly Gregor came around he was sitting on the sofa behind me so I was playing it and it was the last about seven minutes or something and I turned around to him and he was crying <laughs> I don't know if was, he didn't like it or what, yeah. and he said I said I don't know what to do with this I said I don't know what it's for he said it's for us it's, for, it's got to be for us mm -hmm. and then I think you said the same thing oh yeah and at that the chorus if you can call it the chorus the lyrics in that chorus yeah. I mean, I can't. I cry when we sing it. So, that yeah. what you're trying to make sense for. Yeah. You know, never had a reason before. What you're trying to make sense for. It's yeah. like love. Who can make sense of this? Just go with it. Just feel it. Those words and that melody combined. It's, it's what gets it. All I have to do is think oh, about yeah. it. I'm glad. I, yeah. Me I'm just, too. Oh I'm God, glad it landed. Past the Kleenex. Me too. Oh, so um, and so let's just get, come land this jet by um, just talking about this box set. Because we, you know, we've talked about all these mm -hmm. records, and and there's a sort of a bonus one there. Mm -hmm. Well, like, so you went back into the studio to sort of do a carry on, which is which is riding on the tide of love. So tell us briefly about. Oh that. yeah, that was really a lockdown project. That was a, a song that we we found <laughs> we found a song that Lorraine and I had written together. Actually, Lorraine wrote most of it, I think, um, which isn't common. You don't really write no. a lot. Found this song, and I said to Tom, our manager, I said, you know, 
I find this I've forgotten about. It would have, should have gone on City of Love, I think. Right on the title of Love, it feels like it belongs. And as it happened, we needed to do something, which, you know, lockdown otherwise, people were just disappearing. So we had to do so. So it was a lockdown little mini album. I don't think of it as a real album. It was a conglomeration of things that were left over and some other things that were, were around at the time. And we had to make it remotely because we couldn't be in the same room together. So, yeah. But the other, but the nice thing that is on the box set is this little acoustic mm -hmm. campfire album. And the last tour that we did, in the middle of the show, we just broke the thing down and we all just played as a, a band sitting around. And we got together, I think in the winter of last year, in our house, set up a little drum kit in the, in the lounge. Lorraine lit a f little fire in the grate. There was a piano in the room. Lewis brought his double bass. And we just routined a whole lot of songs that we knew. And well, we chose our favourites yeah, that and, we thought worked acoustically. Yeah. So we have Chocolate Girl and we actually have um, All Over the World from... Whatever you say. Whatever you say, say nothing. Different songs that just sound great acoustically. Um, Queen of the New Year. Queen of the New Year. Yeah. You know, that's it was just really enjoyable. And we also did a few covers that we had been doing live. So we love doing these songs, so it's nice to have them on record for ourselves. Yeah. And hopefully what, you'll what like was, them. What was the gem for you from that session? Well, actually, I love Chocolate Girl because Chocolate Girl to me is a song that's, it kind of gets, people love it, but it has almost got its own character now when we do gigs and you tell a funny story about Alan and blah, blah, blah. And there's a poignancy about that song that I think is lost sometimes. And when we do this acoustic version of it, there's a beautiful, heartbreaking little piano riff that, that just makes it for me. And I don't do all the backing vocals that I do on the normal version. We just sing it together as a much more straightforward song. And I think that's my favourite. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, gosh, you know, look, I as I was... You know, taking these CDs out and playing them and being reminded and actually I I, I, I identify as a as a as Deacon Blue fan and there were records there that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> I mean this is just wonderful. We didn't I, know it, them. It, it's <laughs> it's so great having this box set now and, and I just thought I thought how amazing it must be for you mm. to have your whole life. It's like this is your life. That's exactly in a box, what Ricky right? said. He opened the he opened the, the delivery last week, laid it out in the kitchen table, and as I walked past, you said to me, "That's our life on the kitchen table." Yeah. yeah how does it feel looking at it all now? It's funny because I always remember when my first record. I, went, I thought, I wonder what happens when you make a whole lot of records. You, you line them all up and go, <laughs> "Look at it," you know. And finally, got a chance to do it. No, I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of the relationship with the band as well. I'm really proud of these guys. And by these guys, I mean Lorraine and these guys. Of but course. I mean the, the whole band, because they're my brothers. Uh, you know, as well, as well as us being married, these guys are really close friends. And we've been all through a lot of things together. You know, people have marriages have come and gone and different illnesses and things. We've lost, we've lost one of our best friends as well. Mm. So it's a lot to go through. But we've been through it together, and it's a unique thing, you know, that to, to go from nothing to go from playing this little toilet <laughs> gigs in 1986 to playing the Royal Albert Hall or wherever it is, you know, it's an amazing journey, and I'm so grateful for that. Well, so are we. Is is this box set your? Is that your legacy now, or is there a postscript? Last question. Oh, I, <laughs> well, I've been writing songs, and I. If they're not for Deacon Blue, I don't know who they're for because they have to be for Deacon Blue. I, we've done a lot of writing and yeah. demoing in the house. and It always starts that where Ricky writes one song and I think, what are you writing that for? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> he has to write. You know, if they, if they come to you, you're going to have to write them. So I would never say that there would never be any more Deacon Blue music. Yeah. But I would also never say we've got any plans to bring we it we actually, out. Yeah, we don't make plans because I think we've been through enough time and we're at an age where we, if we get to the end of this tour, we're all still standing, you know, we'll be doing well. But I, I love to think that I, it's not the last time we've recorded together because I love doing it. I just, I just really Great. enjoy it. Well, like I, I say it again, when the, when the last song on the last album is the one that makes me cry every time, Aww. that can't be the last thing you ever do. <laughs> It's such a pleasure to meet you and to talk about oh, your you incredible thank career. Thank you so much yeah, for having thanks us. Thanks so much, Eddie. It's been really enjoyable.